data is going to transform a lot of aspects of our lives, including music. To be able to use machine learning to create new sounds and new ideas that then you can incorporate in your own works, that's an amazing ambition. We've got access now to more data than we've ever had before and a greater range of data. The question is, does the fact that if we think about music as communication, as storytelling, is it a problem for uh, AI or not? The answer, I think, is uh, a yes and a no. What I'm interested in is, is the new elements that it might generate. Or alternatively, can this technology, in a sense, be used to extend human experience? It started by uh, Odette and me having a, a conversation. We became really interested in kind of like the question of musical data. I got involved with this network because Odette and Frederico were wanting to understand the way that data of different forms is going to impact the way that we understand music and the way we research it in the future. This led to eventually through kind of a lot of steps, I was interested in kind of the live interaction between computers and performers on stage. And I was interested in the recent developments in machine learning. And this led eventually to this uh, research network. The idea was to bring people from very different backgrounds who are kind of around the idea of data is going to transform a lot of aspects of our lives, including music. And we thought we as musicians should be active in kind of setting the agenda and deciding or, or suggesting what is what are the kind of useful musical questions. So I think that was the starting point of kind of like starting to think about this network and, and trying to understand when data, for example, is data and when it starts to be meaningful. So the network has been running for 18 months and one of the things we did is we did a series of online seminars and we were able to record most of them and they are available on our website. And I think they're kind of a really interesting collection because they are really diverse the perspectives ranging from uh, neuroscience to music making to media culture. So taken together, I think they're a really good resource. The other thing is that there are new collaborations that emerge out of this network itself. So we organized two workshops and each workshop included both short presentations, discussions and a concert, all integrated into one. And we really wanted the kind of concerts to be part of the event and they were kind of in the middle of the day and they included discussion and kind of the discussions flowed from the discussion section into the music and into the discussion about the music and then back out into kind of other presentation. There is a thought about um, Laurie, yes. how you can capture, if you can capture, those incredibly human traits um, that improvisation has with a machine. I mean, it's just really interesting to think about that. It might have been about a year ago, to 22, we all went to the University of York for a workshop, and there it was a real focus on improvisation, which was of great interest to us, and improvisation and AI. I really do feel that the network has it's very valuable for all of us and um, then it, of course it's now to think about how to continue with um, what we've got. Before we start, just as a sec, um, what you're seeing over here is Francesca's ECG, so that's her heartbeat. This is the electrical activity of her heart and the ECG is on top of her respiration data. So you can see her breathing, that grey scale mounds, that's her breathing, breathing in, breathing out. We are in Cheltenham today in part of the Science Festival and we present some of the work that we developed 
within this network. And two collaborations came out, uh, developed through this meeting that we enabled. One of them is an improvisation between saxophonist uh, Francesca uh, Schroeder and one of the network partners, Federico uh, Ruben, who is uh, like me, a kind of composer, programmer, somewhere in between. And they are improvising together. And in this instance, they will also be equipped with sensors that pick up physiological measurements, which is part of Elaine Chu's uh, research. And our idea is to show the audience what happens live when performers perform and the data we can collect in performance and what meaning can we find in that. For me, I don't see it as benefits because I think like what draws me to, to making music is actually curiosity. So it's not what's easier for me but rather what's interesting. When it comes to these new techniques of working with data, what I'm interested in is the new elements that it might generate rather than what sounds very much like the original data set. Some people are interested in AI, I think like mostly to make money for commercial purposes. And I think those are the people that are aiming to replicate. But there's also people that uh, are interested in the new affordances that this new technology brings. Well, I see us harnessing the use of machine learning in really useful ways um, to broaden access to tools and to music worldwide. I mean, that's one thing that I think it really could help with. As a composer, you're always looking to find new ways to do something in a different way and always looking to jump away from what you do if, if, if only you return after that. But actually, to be able to use machine learning to create new sounds and new ideas that then you can then incorporate in your own works, that's an amazing ambition and I think that we'll see a lot more of that going forward. Essentially, uh, quite a few different independent modules that each one takes something from the piano, listens in a certain way and responds in a certain way. And most of what I do is just decide at each moment whether I want to activate this one or that one or that one. And I can activate five or six of them together and you, you heard them kind of layered over one another. We don't have a definition of music data. Music data can be a lot of different things. That's part of the reason we put this network together. But also what kind of the, the listening habits of different people, that's data about music. Maybe an hour or so of sound material, so a WAV file, whether it's measuring people's bodily responses to music, so the heart rate, physiological arousal and so on, to understand their emotions, or using interviews and more qualitative techniques. You can use motion capture, all kinds of sensors. While we focus on the fact that music is something that we listen to, we know that what we see and other kind of cultural factors are also important. So there is a lot of potential data and we want to ask, okay, how do we bring these kind of different manifestations together in kind of interesting ways to make the research uh, more productive, more in depth. Youth Music surveyed nearly 3,000 creatives across the UK. They found 63% of young people incorporate AI in creative processes. We've got access now to more data than we've ever had before and a greater range of data. So there's huge possibilities, but with that comes certain risks as well. Currently there's a lot of work on AI and of course then you can generate lots of data and the way you represent that data is really, really important. If we're representing music as data, it means we have to make certain decisions about what we're representing. MIDI is a form of a representation of data that's used, but it only captures really pitch and rhythm. Which basically is used by electronic instruments. And it basically says at this point in time, let's, we want a C, an E and a G, for example. And then there's a long sequence of such things, which are kind of analogous to what would, what would appear on a score, but obviously they're machine readable and, and easy for us to work with. Now pitch and rhythm are important to the cultures that MIDI came out of, but actually there are things like timbre, which are really important to other cultures. You think about shakuhachi, a Japanese uh, flute for instance, timbre is really important, but that data wouldn't capture those timbre characteristics. So we need to understand data because um, the data that we're using is representing our values about music, and um, it, that data is also then entering into the way that music is made and shared in the future. The music industry, as we know it, has today changed forever. It will never be the same again. This new song from Drake and The Weeknd 
Except it's not by Drake in the weekend. It's by some robots. I came in with my ex. That, and that really sound like some Drake. What? What? <laughs> that was not them. That was AI. So this is a terrifying time. It's definitely a terrifying time for the labels. So the use of data and um, AI music generation, which is the projects I'm involved in at the moment, they, they have certain threats or consequences. One obvious one would be creative labor. So what happens to um, musicians if we can generate music from existing music, then what's the role of, of uh, music creators? Yes, we can have it as an assistive technology. That's, that's one thing. Um, but it could have major impacts on the livelihoods, for instance, or change the livelihoods significantly. This isn't the first time it's happened to Drake. Recently, an AI cover of the song Munch prompted Drake to say on Instagram, this is the final straw, AI. When you come up with a rhythm, it's supposed to be a flash of inspiration. If someone's doing it for you or a machine is doing it for you, it's like, why am I making music in the first place? You know, you spend as much time as possible to perfect your craft and to know that technology has reached a place where it can literally replace you. We're not looking to replace musicians. We're looking to give musicians new experiences. There's also the kind of philosophical danger which says, what does this say about us as human beings? Because if we, if we find that the computers are improvising as well as human beings, does that devalue human beings or Alternatively, can this technology, in a sense, be used to extend human experience? I mean, that's just one example, but there are a number of things, and there are maybe two, two moments at which one can intervene. So one is the kind of post-creation, and that's what most of the talk is about at the moment. It's about things like regulation, having best practice guidelines, and so on. But actually, the other moment to intervene is before creation. And, you know, if you think about something like working with nuclear or if you're a doctor or something, you know, you have a license. So some people would say, well, actually, people should be licensed to use AI to make sure that it, it, what, what you're doing with it is fair and transparent and uh, ethical and so on. The one final thing I can say about this ethical issue is relates to kind of the core idea of the network that so far, the research is derived per primarily by the technology. And that means that people are applying machine learning to the data they have. But the data they have is an accident of various decisions people made. And it's biased. It clearly represents some ones or some, a lot of people or few people who curated various data sets or that this data was easy to collect. And if we want to make a, a kind of more ethical and inclusive research field, we have to kind of think carefully about how do we make the data uh, kind of more inclusive, more broad, uh, kind of more representative of music in kind of multifaceted. From my angle, if I'm listening to a piece of music and enjoying it, I don't mind if an AI made it or a human made it. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. I'm enjoying the piece of music and I want to listen to it and that's great. And the other thing, you know, to make AI technology, music technology, um, an AI generation and data capture and use that is the future that you want to see. And as I say, that means working with all the different stakeholders' perspectives on what that good future looks like. And it's not going to be the same for everybody. The dominant trend that we see is often kind of human versus machine, that AI is going to take over and make us all redundant. And we want to challenge that and say that actually AI could be very useful. AI and music data can enhance musical experiences, can enhance musical activities, can create opportunities for performers, for listeners, for composers in various ways. And if we see this kind of gradual shift in the public discourse, that will also be very useful.